Sarah Fran Wisby. Uh, I'm reading to you from an alley south of Market near my workplace. Uh, I'm going to read a piece called The Intruder that is unpublished and probably won't be published, so that's why I'm going to read it to you here today. <clears throat> Alice Dorn, minor American painter, lies in her underwear on her living room carpet in the early morning light, waiting for the devil to lick her up and down. It isn't sexy underwear, and she doesn't feel sexy. She feels achy and middle-aged. But the devil hasn't forsaken her yet. Power and light, she asks for, and a mouth with leathery lips and an ice-hot tongue materializes to touch her eyelids nubs of her toes, other nubs. Once this has happened, she is ready to get up and paint. She makes coffee and gets into her work clothes, a smock-like dress and a stiff cotton apron, as bloodied with paint as her canvases, but less organized, like the placenta that accompanies a birth. She's painting a still life in the corner by the dust-filmed window, pleats of prosciutto layered on a silver tray, red and white striped like a flag rippled by wind, with the reflected overcast sky on the platter beneath it. It's always overcast in her part of town. In some places, the threadbare sky allows sunlight to sift through. In other places, it hunches thickly, nibbled at by smaller, darker clouds. She paints each ribbon of fatted flesh as if it throbbed with the joys of sacrifice, as though meat were a message of love from its maker. She goes deep into the meat and comes out shining. Around noon, her hands ache too much to continue. She's 44 and can't paint for as long as she used to. No more 10-hour stretches like the ones she pulled all through grad school either because she has more pain than she used to have, or because she is learning to recognize pain as a friend rather than an opponent to be held out against as long as possible. Coming slowly out of the painting and back into her body, she perceives first the nauseating rush of blood returning to her hands, then the more pleasant ache of hunger, and goes out to the little garden behind her house, where nothing grows but cabbage and kohlrabi, and that only because the Russians who lived here before her planted it. She unearths a purple kohlrabi head, brushes off the dirt, cuts it into slices with a pocket knife on the smooth table of a tree, trunk, tree stump, and eats it with salt, looking up at the whitish sky, bare legs folded under her to keep warm. Her hunger has barely started to leave her when the desire for a cigarette arises. No sooner than one desire is stopped up, headed off, occluded, another occurs. Each day an object lesson in insatiability. A movement in the grass next door catches her eye. The neighbor's cat stalking a mouse or a wounded bird. Another being with agency and fear and yearning, born up with bones and a beating heart. Its predicament the exact same as hers, but without the absurd double burden of being alive and thinking about being alive. When Alice thinks of her physical needs, she pictures them as balloons and herself holding the BB gun, though lately she's grown tired of shooting. What if she just stopped? What for, greedy mouth, that I'm wrenched around in various ways to fill you? Where is the lesson in it? Where is the money in it? Art is not enough. It never was, but now it really isn't. There's no way to live in the world the way she would like to live and still have money to keep on living. Every day, in order not to worry about money, she must pretend she is on the verge of dying. This is good practice for dying, maybe but it doesn't help with everyday tasks like buying meat and paintbrushes and planting food so there will one day be something to eat besides kohlrabi. Occasionally, just when things seem most dire, a stranger decides to buy a painting. The stranger's money gets deposited by her gallerist directly into her bank account. Who 
is this stranger, this anonymous savior? She is afraid to know because he or she is everything to her. It could be several people, but Alice has a feeling she is just one person, her collector, her enabler, who is not rich enough to buy art very often, just often enough that Alice can continue to pretend she is dying. When moving through the world of people, if someone cuts her off in traffic, she shouts, fuck you, I'm dying, into the trapped air behind the windshield of her Volvo before remembering it isn't true. Or at least no more true for her than for anybody else on the road in their swift, swiftly moving private death cocoons. In lucid moments, she worries that in living as if she were dying, she may be hurrying her death along, tempting it. Because she only cares for art, she does a piss-poor job of living. She is polishing the stone of her death, constantly gnawing it and swabbing the dust with her tongue, rebuilding the stone inside herself. She smokes too much and eats too little. At night, in dreams, she paints the skull-white sky. I should get a job, she thinks. Instead of waning and waning until it disappears, Alice notices her body growing swollen and tender. Putting on jeans one morning, she can't button the top button. I must be about to bleed, she thinks, but weeks pass and the blood doesn't come. She is not dying, she is pregnant. How ridiculous. More likely it is a tumor, a fat dirigible of disease. These different problems with similar symptoms seem to her in their arbitrariness like two blooms on the same stalk, like the neighbor's cat and its prey, like two stones falling at the same rate from a high place. Pissing on a plastic wand from the drugstore seems to confirm what? A visitation? She can't recall any incident that might have led to a conception can't recall ever being anything but alone, herself intact. How could someone have broken in to deposit this intruder without her knowing it? Was there a night stricken from the record by drunkenness or a more alarming depar departure from self that allowed for such a breach? Did the devil have his way with her in corporeal form? How many times and in what positions? Did she like it? More disconcerting than the break-in was the fact of habitation. What would make a home out of her? The poor thing. Such bad luck right out of the gate. She considers drinking turpentine to get rid of it, to get rid of herself. She thinks about electrified fences, about car crashes, about matches and gasoline, about purchasing a firearm. She thinks there must be a law against selling a firearm to a woman with tears in her eyes, and she has tears in her eyes all the time now, possibly from the hormones. I could keep going. I'd like to keep going. Still, she must paint. She finishes the painting of the meat platter, tosses the rotting scraps to the neighbor's cat. She buys fruit, ripe, bulging figs, and glossy, wet-looking plums. She stabs them open with the sharp tip of a carving knife and lays them on the wooden board with the wet knife beside them. She considers their textures, perfumes, their sugary wiles, their reproductive strategy entirely dependent on being eaten and shat out covered in dung, deposited in a hospitable place, not here on a table under the gaze of a madwoman intent on interrupting the natural way of things. Now, exploring her cruelty toward figs, she feels a thin sheen of mud darkening her mind. All flesh is flesh is flesh. If meat is murder, so is this stabbing. It doesn't escape her that the shapely figs are like little pregnant bellies, the clear liquid pooling on the cutting board like amniotic fluid. Is she mad? No, she's a motherfucking artist. That had been her joke back in art school in the late 80s. That was what MFA stood for. There are days she wants to be non-human, 
some critter that knows when to move, when to hide, when to feed, when to sleep. Enlivened by light, soothed by darkness. Fearful, yes, she doesn't suppose there is any animal that doesn't have fear, but without dread, without any concern for the art market. Did grasshoppers depend on the grass market? Of course they did. And songbirds depended on the grasshopper market? And singer-songwriters depended on the songbird market? Ha! Everything connected in remarkable ways. Everybody knew that. Except for the birds and the grasshoppers, who seemed content to swoop and hop and peck and breed and die under the hot sun. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you.